Okay, good evening everyone. Nice to see you here in this lovely summer evening. Um, I would have expected more, but uh, it's good to start like this. So COVID has been really bad. You all know how bad it was for our health, the health of uh, our loved ones, uh, the economy, but it was even worse for our social life and our social structures. Uh, many of you here haven't seen ever, uh, or um, I, I see you from afar. And um, so um, we thought that it might be a good way to restart building this community spirit that always was the, uh, the strong point of, uh, of the Cypress Institute, which attracted many of us here, uh, that there was this cohesion, this network this of, of, of people uh, that uh, felt that they, are, they belong to a community. And we acted like a community during the pandemic, but we lost this uh, direct uh, contact and the ability to you know, capacity to communicate directly with people. Some people I, I only know virtually, essentially. I haven't seen them ever. Uh, so it's like uh, uh, they're non real. So uh, when I see them first time, I, I'm wondering are they real or not? So, yeah, so we started this, um, we thought that this might be a good way to restart. Um, and we are restarting one way or another. Uh, it, it seems that. Uh, I mean, is going south at the moment. I mean, with all these cases, uh, but um, uh, hopefully, very soon, if not already, all of us will be vaccinated, uh, and uh, we will be ready to figure out how we can continue our lives uh, from now on. So this series that started already, actually, with events last week. Uh, with Evie uh, 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 presenting the documentary or being hosting the documentary on Keros, that, that was the contribution of many people from the Institute and elsewhere. Uh, but now we're starting a new kind of concept, which is this internal colloquia, uh, which are uh, aimed at um, are you guys, I mean, the people of the Institute, the friends of the Institute, uh, to come here and enjoy the evening. Hopefully all the evenings will be like this and not uh, uh, hotter than that. Uh, and, um, and get together and have a drink. So, so we have this series of colloquia now uh, with our own people, starting from the directors and the leadership of the Institute, and then hopefully moving from September to uh, the rest of this, our scientists, our great scientists that we have here. So uh, today I'm really, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Tilo, you all know Tilo, uh, Tilo Reren. Uh, he's the director of Star C, of course you know that. Uh, what I didn't know is that Tilo studied earth sciences. I always thought, no, actually I knew, but I, at the beginning I thought you were archeologists. I didn't know you're earth scientists. <laughs> So Tilo did his PhD in Freiburg, he told me. It wasn't in his, uh, in his uh, curriculum vitae, so I had to ask him. So he did his PhD uh, uh, in, in Freiburg, uh, and that was on the volcano of Nisiros, which, I, as I told him previously, I was so impressed when I first flew over with uh, Olympic Air, and I thought, what's that volcano in the middle of the sea? And it was Nisiros. That uh, was a fantastic sight. Me half an hour, and I tell you everything about that volcano. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tilo then moved to became a research scientist uh, uh, at the um, German Institute of Mining for the Mining Museum. Sorry, uh, and then uh, before he moved to UCL uh, to take the chair of Archeo Materials in in UCL for several years. Uh, until he was seconded, still in UCL, seconded uh, uh, in Qatar uh, to lead the 
uh, UCL Qatar, uh, the new flagship at that time of UCL in the, in the Gulf. Uh, he lived that for how many years was it, Tilo? Six years until we got him here. So uh, Tilo will be talking about today about glass. And I will leave it there, um, Tilo. Thank you, George, for your very kind introduction, and I'm very happy to be here in this mild country with a very pleasant weather um, where it rarely goes beyond 40, which uh, used to be the norm back in Qatar. No, I'm, I'm very happy here in, in Cyprus and at the Cyprus Institute talking about what I like to do, what I love to study, ancient materials as a means into understanding ancient societies. Now, I'm not a historian, I'm not an archaeologist, even though the head of the Institute of Archaeology back in London 20 years ago threatened me he would make me an archaeologist, but I can't compete with the depth of thinking in the humanities, in, the, um, in history and archaeology about what life in the past has been. I can only make a contribution to it by applying scientific and engineering approaches to the study of what is left from the past, which is amazingly little. It's a fraction of a percent that survives historically, archaeologically, and we have to reconstruct a picture from that little what's left. And it's not just a random selection, it's a very specific selection, all, almost all, with due respect to Evi Margaritis, almost all organic material did disappear um, while ceramics, metal, glass, stones are more durable and give us, therefore, a bit more to work with. I also like to work with waste material from production processes because, on the one hand, there are little ethical concerns. It's, after all, stuff that had been thrown away by our ancestors rather than carefully tucked away in a temple or in a uh, cemetery to be cherished and kept for the future. This is waste and I'm not too bothered to tick out a little bit and cut it up and study it to retrieve the knowledge and the skill of our ancestors, of those 99% of the people who actually make a society run, rather than the elite who reaps the benefit and gives the direction, which is also necessary. We should acknowledge that. So what I try with my particular interest to do is to understand how commodities, how raw materials were flowing in the past in the large scale and to understand what that tells us about economic conditions in the past, about organization of an economy. And you all remember what um, when Trump decided to start a trade war with China, which can be very easily won, of course, um, and how that impacted economy both in China and more so in America. Um, all these global connections, which still today exist, they did exist 2,000, 3,000 years ago already, and they are not normally represented, recorded, preserved, in the typical documents that the historians study or in the typical temples and palaces and urban centers that archaeology focuses often on to study. So I think by looking at the broader picture, we can actually contribute additional complementary evidence by applying engineering science approaches to what we do, and that should help us to then understand regional connections, specific conditions in specific countries. So going from the very broad brush to a more uh, localized and more detailed picture. Of course, there is always change, has always and will always be. But it's interesting to understand and potentially helpful for our own future to understand what are the drivers of change. And how do we adjust to change? Now, we 
George mentioned it, had the massive impact of COVID, that pandemic. Um, in terms of actually mortality, it's a tiny fraction of a percent of the world population that died. Every single one of them is a catastrophe for that family. But as a figure, as a number, as a, on a societal level, it's tiny. And now think of the pest and the big plague epidemies killing 30% of a population regionally. Um, and then you can see how lucky we are today. Anyway, let's go to glass um, with a little bit of a detour just to illustrate what I'm talk, trying to talk about. If we look at the cars of today, that's roughly what I see glass in the past. Something nice to have. Some people think it's a necessity, but mostly it's a, a, a convenience. <coughs> and it's everywhere in society. Most people have a car or at least access to a car. Where are these cars being built? Globally, um, a lot of them are built in the Un uh, European Union, roughly a quarter of all cars 10, 15 years ago. Similar amount in the United States. Japan is a very significant producer here with almost, well, more than 15% for a small island on the edge of the known world. The rest of Asia, that's mostly India and China. And that's it. So there are, in terms of production regions, there's a limited amount out there. And it's reasonably balanced. A good chunk in the US, which includes, to be honest, it's NAFTA. It's not just the US. So it includes Mexico and Canada, the North, Atlant uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, a good chunk in Europe and a good chunk in Asia. Noth not that much in Australia or Africa or Arabia. But how does it look on the regional level? If we look at where in a specific country the cars that are used in that country, where were they built? If you look at Germany, a very proud car building country, three quarters of all cars driven in Germany were built in Germany in 1985. Very similar in the US. Um, three quarters US built. You see that red triangle, that's Japan, which has a significant impact on the market, both in Europe and in the US, and of course, in Japan itself. 95% of all cars driven in Japan were built in Japan. Only 5%, six, seven maximum per year, were built elsewhere. So you see already an imbalance in trade here. Um, if you read the tiny number here for Europe, the American built cars back then, 1985, was a fraction of a percent, while European cars in America at least were around a few percent, four percent. That's all your BMWs and Mercedes Benzes in America. And there's tax behind it. The Americans levy um, two and a half percent of tax on car imports. Europe levies 10 percent. So that explains partly why there are fewer American cars in Europe than European cars in America. Um, we don't know much about tax in effect in antiquity. It's one of those things which actually do a lot of impact, but which is very difficult to study in prehistory. Now, if you look 30 years later, Germany is pretty much unchanged. Three quarters of cars built um, used in Germany, were built in Germany. Um, in the US, the picture has massively changed. The big car companies in the Rust Belt are not as productive anymore. That's why it's a Rust Belt. Um, <coughs> the, the Japanese import has significantly increased, while in Japan itself, the picture is unchanged. What I would like to highlight is that both in Europe where are we? Down here. That reddish triangle is new, and that's South Korea. And the same here, 8% in the US market, 
South Korea, which didn't exist as a significant car producer 30 years earlier. So if you, as a future archaeologist, go through the scrap heaps, the um, graveyards of car um, disposal agencies in those countries, that's the data you will find and which will help you to recognize, okay, South Korea, one of those tiger nations really pushing global sphere, the Americas moving to Amazon and um, Apple and whatnot away from manufacturing. So that kind of approach um, is what I try to do in the past, in late antiquity or Byzantine period. It's an interesting one because it's historically reasonably well documented. We know a lot about politics in that period, quite a lot about religion. Um, I'm not talking about car religion here, even though I am German, but in terms of religious religion. What we will be studying here is a change in the composition of glass, which I would like you to see a little bit as a change from BMW to Mercedes, from Toyota to Mitsubishi, from Ford to Chrysler. It's the same thing, just made differently by a different company, reflecting in a different logo for the car or a different slight different chemical composition for the glass. But all of that change happens in the framework of significant political change, as we shall see. Luckily, thanks to a lot of colleagues, we have a lot of data now, which we can start pooling and interpreting. And of course, it's highly relevant for Cyprus and the neighborhood here to understand our own history. And I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad to be here and not in London, on the other edge of outside Europe, uh, because here I can actually work within the region rather than looking at it from a far distance. So this is what we are looking at, the first millennium of the common era of the Mediterranean. And specifically, we will be looking here at the eastern end, there's Cyprus, in case you hadn't noticed. 2,000 years ago, it was all a small internal pond of the European Empire, uh, sorry, of the Roman Empire, <laughs> um, stretching from Scotland down to Egypt and um, into the Arabian Gulf. <clears throat> One homogenous empire, lots of interconnected trade and exchange and people moving, the military moving, craftspeople moving, administrators moving, we can't do without administrators, I confess. A few hundred years later, somebody takes a sword and cuts it in half. And we have the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine, and we have Western Rome, which then pretty quickly dwindles and disappears. Kind of, at least if you're British. Um, that's what they feel. Um, so here we then look at the Eastern end. But that Byzantine Empire, for all its splendor and deep roots, um, kept shrinking, and around 700 AD, um, it's reduced to not that much anymore. Cyprus, you will notice, has fallen off the empire. Actually, when I try to read the historical literature, there seems to be confusion as to whether it's Byzantine or Arab managed. They seem to have found a way to share management of Cyprus um, one way or the other. There's this brief respite, the Byzantine Empire bouncing back and expanding a little bit more in the early second millennium. So fluctuation going up and down and Cyprus is Byzantine again. But um, yeah, of course not today. So if we put that in a straight line, who ruled Cyprus? The first half of the first millennium, it's the Romans. Then there's a significant chunk of the Byzantine Empire. Then this Arab-Byzantine joint rule, shared tax income, um, lots of interesting activity, and then a little bit more Byzantine, and then we are out of the first millennium. During that time, throughout that whole millennium, we basically have just two glass-producing regions. So not as with my car metaphor three, Asia, Europe, and the US, but only two, one in Egypt and one in Syro-Palestine. 
They were making glass, supplying the whole of the empire with it. Whatever that whole of the empire may be, up to Scotland at the early period, and much less later. But there's hardly any evidence for glass making elsewhere. So what type of glass are we talking about? Lamps, for instance, polycandelabra, a lot of lamps hanging in this ring, ideally in a church somewhere, with some oil resting in here and a wick over the edge, burning and giving light. For the whole thing not to topple over, you have a very dense stem underneath, which keeps it hanging and stable and upright without uh, spilling the burning oil, which would have been um, unhelpful. But also storage containers, beautiful vessels of all sorts and kind, um, <coughs> mass-produced. It's a, it's a mass material by this time. In the sixth century, goblets um, are very abundant, these things which you could either drink wine from or still use as an oil lamp. Same principle, it's stable, standing with a wick in the oil and burning happily. A big invention of the Romans, the window, la fenêtre, the fenster. Um, a sheet of soft glass stretched and pulled into a square or rectangle to be put into the wind, uh, the wind eye, the opening in your building where the wind blows through, to close that window while still allowing light in, but keeping heat inside as well and cold out. So a range of functional and beautiful applications. All of this glass, it's important actually to see as a composite material, as an additive material. If we just step briefly back, if you look at metal production, you take a very complex ore out of the Trodos Mountains, which has a dozen chemical elements in it, and you make a lot of chemistry to extract just that one element you want, copper, silver, whatever it is. For glass, it's the other way around. You take two or three clean raw materials and you combine them to one final product, which then is chemically pretty complex. And that is helpful, actually, for us. The bulk of that is silica, sand mostly, as white as you can get it. That's roughly two-thirds of the weight of glass is just silica, a very common material in earth sciences. The beach is full of it. Soda, roughly 15% is natron, um, the chemical symbol Na for soda comes from this natron, which is synonymous with the wadi natrun, that one wadi in Egypt where this natron occurs in vast quantities in a specific salt lake. The salt lake here in Larnaca unfortunately doesn't produce it, it makes ordinary table salt, but it's the same principle. You have a brine that in the summer dries up and creates a white salt, which has a specific composition that it can melt with the silica to make glass. With the silica sand, typically, that you get from the beach, you get fragments of shell, mussel shells and other stuff, which add lime to the picture, calcium oxide. That's 90, 95% of your glass. And then there's a little bit of spice in it, minor oxides, which come with the sand. We will not really have seen white, white sand. Most sand is yellowish. That yellow is iron oxide. You will have seen dark particles in it, which could be titanium oxide. You will have seen red particles in it, which could be aluminum rich or magnesium rich. So it's that little bit of flavor in the sand which is important for us because that goes with the sand into the glass and stays in there. How do we make glass? We know that archaeologically. This is 1,000, 2,000 years ago. 
excavation squares here, five by five meter squares, and you see the footprint, one, two, three, four, five, I think there's a dozen in that row, of individual furnaces making glass. Every single one of these furnaces was making around eight to 10 tons of glass in a single firing. Single firing sounds quick, but it's about a month at least that you need to fire that one furnace to melt your sand with your soda to get a homogeneous block of glass. How do we know? Why do we know? Because there is one of those blocks of glass actually is archaeologically surviving in Israel. Here with a dedicated group of visitors admiring, doing a pilgrimage to that block of glass in Becherin. Um, normally that would have been broken up with sledgehammers, poor chaps doing that, and sold on. This particular one went haywire, it's bad quality, so they left it behind for us. So, if we take any of those glass finds now and look at that chemically, they're all soda lime silica glass, but it's the spices that differ. That differ. The trace elements, the minor oxides, and they allow us, if we look, say, titanium versus aluminium, if we look at aluminium versus silica, they allow us to differentiate different producers of glass because each producing kiln site, furnace site, was using their local sand. And their local sand is different from the sand of the neighbor. So that signature of minor oxides in the sand stays in the glass and then you can say, oh, that's a glass from that company and this is a glass from another company. Ian Freestone has developed that model um, 20 years ago very nicely, actually on material from Cyprus, um, where everybody in the Eastern Mediterranean who was making glass got their natron from the Wadi Natrun and then used their own local sand to make glass. The natron is always the same, but the sand is different. Why would you take and carry the um, natron to the sand and not the other way around? We will look at that in a minute. But that's the model that we operate with. So if we now go back to our timeline, we still have that political colorful stretch in the center. In the upper part, I've plotted the different type of glass compositions that were produced in Syro-Palestine, which have very inspiring names such as Roman blue-green or Levantine one or Levantine two. Um, in Egypt, they were doing stuff called SB decolorized, antimony decolorized, or HIMT, a very intriguing name, which means high in iron, manganese, and titanium. Another one is called FOI 3.2 or FOI 2.1 because of the famous author who published those and defined those compositions first. And then Egypt 1 and 2 as, oh, somewhere in Egypt, somebody was making glass. And they have specific time production periods attached to them. So that is our map onto which we can now try and project what we are analyzing here. Just to briefly point out why people were actually moving the natron, which as a salt is not the easiest to ship because it, if it gets wet, um, it will dissolve. And you are talking seaborne trade here. Um, and not the sand. But if you look at the weight proportions, the soda is only about a third of the weight, while the sand is more than two-thirds of the weight. So it makes much more sense to move the smaller material than the big material. But the real cracker is the fuel. That one month's worth of firing of your eight tons of glass, you burn many, many tons of wood for that. And that's even more difficult to ship and to transport, not only because of the multiple in weight, but even the multiple, multiple in volume, because wood is pretty, 
light compared to sand. So you will actually make glass where you have fuel, such as in the mountains of the Lebanon, or at least agricultural waste from the fertile Nile Delta. Straw, very quick and hot burning stuff that gives a nice flame and heat radiating onto your mixture to melt it. But also, once you have your eight tons of glass, what do you do with it? You don't need that in a lifetime for yourself or your friends. You need market access. You need the infrastructure of some ship taking it elsewhere and to pay you for it. So it's a pretty complex economic construction that defines where glass making makes sense. So we know we have these two sources, source regions of glass, one in Syria, Palestine, one in Egypt. Each of those has a handful of different chronologically staggered production um, sites. Why do we need to know that? And this is where my dear colleague uh, Dr. Florenzos comes in and my equally dear colleague Dr. Oikonomu, because in Amatus in Limassol, um, 1500 years ago, there was a glass workshop. And uh, Dr. Florenzos is working on that excavated material, excavated in the late 1970s, early 1980s. He is preparing that for publication. And he was generous enough to allow me and invite me and Artemios to help study and analyze that glass. So we have lots and lots of these typical bags, each with a sample of glass in it, some better fragments. There's the odd, completely preserved glass vessel here, but most of it is in fragmented shape. And you recognize here immediately these stems of the lamp, the heavy, thick stem of the polycandelabra lamp, which survives. The delicate blown bowl is shattered and lost. And you see the feet of the goblets here as well. But it's the lamp stems that survive quite nicely. There are some beautiful objects, decolorized, very high quality, and mold blown and beautiful material. So there's a lot that the art historian, this uh, typology person, can work here but also a lot that is clearly mass-produced quantity of material. You see here a lot of those feet of the goblets that are surviving. And window panes. You wouldn't have a window pane normally in your own building at home. You would have it in the administrative, in the um, prestige buildings. So it shows already there was something serious going on here. But for me, the most exciting group of finds were those, these chunks of broken up rough glass with dirt adhering to it, not just dirt from the excavation, but real soil fired onto it. These are fragments of a glass furnace. Now, I'm not saying they were making glass in Limassol. I'm saying they have fragments of a glass-making furnace here. The question now is, is it one of those big furnaces that we had seen in Syro-Palestine in Israel, or is it, one, is it remains of a small furnace, like the one here on the right, where people were remelting the imported glass to then actually make a vessel from it? The same construction principle, just a s order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude smaller. And that there was a glass working furnace is clear because in Limassol, among the material, there's a lot of these drips and drops and drawn out bits of glass which are very diagnostic of the glass worker testing, is my glass hot enough? Is it the right consistency to blow as a chewing gum bubble, to blow into a nice beautiful object? Or do I need to put on a more, bit more wood to make it even hotter to get to the right temperature? So somebody clearly was working glass in Limassol. Um, 
question is what type of glass and where did they get it from? So what do we do? Being crude and brutal as I sometimes like to be, I take my saw and cut out a chunk of that glass, but then I try to behave and be very generous and you see this disc here is about two centimeter diameter and that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples in it. So we really need only a, a tiny finger clipping, fingernail clipping sort of material to then analyze it. Of course we need to keep track of the numbers. That polished block then goes into our beloved scanning electron microscope, um, which I'm very happy to have here at the Cypress Institute. And it then gets analyzed and transformed into this. And then the excitement really starts. Now I will not spend the next half hour talking you through those numbers in detail, I'm afraid. <coughs> but I want to highlight very exemplary we have sorted them here already, Artemios and I. There is glass that we recognize as Levantine, and there's other glass that we recognize as FOI 2.1. And if you look at the aluminum values, for instance, the Levantine glass has persistently 3% aluminum. The FOI 2.1 has only about 2, 2.5%. The sulfur content is significantly different, much lower in the Levantine, much higher in uh, for 2.1. Titanium, around one-tenth of a percent in the Levantine glass, around 0.15 uh, in the Egyptian for 2.1, and so on. And you see also the quality of data that we need to be sure that 0.13 is actually reliably more than 0.09 weight percent of titanium oxide. It may not look like a big difference, but it makes a, a huge difference. So data quality, running reference samples, being sure what we do is essential here. With those numbers, we can then plot back into this diagram and similar ones that I showed you earlier, where we have defined groups of compositions that show us these red ones here. That is the official HIMT, the high iron manganese titanium glass, um, according to Ian Freestone. These here are the official Egypt One glasses. Down here, this triangle cluster, that is the official FOI uh, 2.1, which just to confuse everybody, is labeled here as sixth century glass. The fifth century glass sits a little bit further here. And then we have the Levantine um, down there. So we take that as our reference graph and plot our data on it. And you will see, OK, we have a few HIMT glasses, one, two, three, four, five. But down here, those green crosses overlaying the yellow ones. You see here, that's all our Levantine glass down there. And similarly, the FOI 2.1, the 6th century glass, you see how nicely that matches the reference data. So suddenly we are able to break down our already broken glass, break it down analytically, and recognize the different pre-existing families and see what they are, where they came from, when they were made. So we can plot that back into our graph of timeline here. And the majority, 115 here, are Levantine glass. Um, the next biggest group, 38, are FOI 2.1 from Egypt, most likely, nicely in the 6th century, which I'm pleased to say matches what the archaeologists already knew before me. Um, but it's good to have independent indication for it as well. The HIMT glass is a little bit earlier, fourth into the fifth century. Not a surprise that that is very little here. It's interesting to see that the Roman manganese decolored glass, which is typically first, second century, shows up here. And Artemius and I will have to look into those particular objects and see what they are. 
Are they from old tombs, from Roman tombs in Limassol? Are they um, heirloom material that survived um, many generations? It's interesting to, to follow up on that. So there's more work to be done. But overall, Amatus, we have two, three quarters Levantine glass and one quarter Egyptian glass, which, okay, is not that spectacular. It matches broadly what we have seen elsewhere in Cyprus. Colleagues, um, Ian Freestone I mentioned earlier, in Maroni Petrera, or Andrea Celia in Yeros Kipu, um, and in Calavasos. So it's typical for that Byzantine late antiquity period that we have mostly Levantine and more or less Egyptian glass in here. So what does it actually now tell us? Where do we want to go with that? What we now need to do is to refine that picture and we want to actually link the origin of the artifact with the artifact type. If you look at window panes, I mentioned earlier the window panes are typical for big administrative or ecclesiastical buildings. It's not your individual um, family home. It's a big project. I would expect that that was one shipment of window glass for a big building project that whatever emperor decreed should be done. So the window panes should be pretty homogenous coming from one delivery maybe several deliveries for several buildings. The lamps, church lamps, often have the same, somebody endows a church and splashes out on 300 lamps to be hung in that church as well. So they might, as, they might be pretty consistent chemically. In a previous study with colleagues uh, Fatma Marii from Jordan, and others, when I was still in London, we looked at glass from Petra and from Deren Abata, a pilgrimage site in Jordan, both Byzantine, but very nicely differentiated. The big Petra church was very homogeneous Levantine glass, very flashy building, all more or less one big event of creating. But well, that little monastery in Deren Abata um, had a much more mixed origin of glass with a lot of Egyptian glass coming in which one could envisage and link to the historically known Egyptian pilgrims coming to that site where um, the salt statue of Lord um, has been um, commemorated. So there one sees a, a, a different social setting, even though it's ecclesiastical, but it's not a big church endowed by an important person. It's a small monastery where pilgrims bring piecemeal things. So we can understand these details from the glass analysis. It would be interesting to break down in Amatus what we see into that kind of level and to link it back to the excavation sites where the glass was documented and found to see what can we learn from that um, old settlement there. And then of course the raw glass. What is that raw glass, these chunks of broken furnace material, what is that doing here? Um, one possibility is that somebody was buying 10 amphora full of glass chunks to be blown, remelted and blown into objects and that chap who sold him the stuff back from Syro-Palestine, because it's Levantine glass, um, put a few bad pieces into those am amphora, goes by weight, and nobody will empty the amphora when they buy it. They will empty them at home. And then you get the not so nice pieces in it. Or, as I said, alternatively, it could be fragments from the actual small furnace that that glass blower used to remelt the perfectly good quality Levantine glass that he bought. Here we will have to look into the question of recycling. And glass is, even today, um, heavily recycled material and has been for the last 2,000 years. And you can trace that. 
because, yes, you have these different clean, clear trace element minor oxide signatures in your glass, but when you start remelting, collecting broken glass, we know they made a good effort visually to keep different types of glass separate, but inevitably you will have some mishap happening. So the recycled glass is a bit more blurry. Also, the sheer act of being remelted, going through the fire again, you get some ash from your fire into the glass, potassium, phosphorus, in particular magnesium, increase over the remelting act. And the more often you remelt it, the higher get those oxides measurably. So we can look at that and we can link that to the working waste and then see is that glass that we see with the furnace fragments fresh from the primary kiln or is that already remelted, recycled, dirty glass from the local workshop. You may have noticed that all the examples I showed you are in that late antique, early Byzantine bracket. I would be very interested to see what happens actually after that 6th century, what happens in the 7th, 8th, 9th century, when we often think, oh, the Arab invasions and everybody was back up onto the trees and nothing happened much here. But there were significant buildings here. Life did go on. People were using glass still. Where did they got the glass from? And certainly later when the Italians come, the Crusaders first and then the proper Italians, they would have brought glass with them in the early second millennium up right to the British. Their gin bottles, where did they bring them from? From India or from Ireland? There's a lot of glass fragment material in the storeroom of the Department of Antiquities, which should be very interesting to analyze and to illustrate on a daily life level what was going on economically. Where were people buying glass when they were part here of the Ottoman Empire? Would they get glass from Istanbul? Would they get glass still from Egypt or not? Things like that. And of course, we need to write that monograph, uh, Temios, um, with Pavlos together on that workshop material, which will be a really nice thing to do. But I won't do that tonight, and I just want to thank you here, finally, for being here. And I thank all of those who are not here, and therefore minimizing the risk of spreading COVID ever, ever further. Um, <clears throat> but you will miss out on the reception afterwards. But I'm particularly grateful to Pavlos Florenzos for, as I said earlier, having given us the tremendous um, honor and opportunity to study this material. And of course to Artemios, who actually did most of the work and should actually be the lead author of the outcome. And then the Leventis Foundation for enabling me to be here in the first place and the Department of Antiquities for allowing me to snip off those bits and pieces and to put them into the SEM. Thank you very much. Well, I'm happy, yes. Yes. So you ask whether, if it's a small furnace, whether we shouldn't see that archaeologically. Yeah. Um, the site preservation is not that grand. And if you would have looked even more closely than you did already at that example that I showed of a small furnace from the Israel Museum in, in Tel Aviv, um, they were raised. The glass blower was working standing and so the, the actual furnace was a meter off the ground. Not much to survive there, apart from the fragments of it with the ceramic material with a glass coat on the inside. 
Sometimes they survive, but often not. Okay. Uh, all right, you, you find archaeologically even more obscure uh, installations. That's why I'm... Uh, yes, um, if you yeah. have a good archaeologist, <laughs> yeah. as you are. <laughs> yes, yes, and, yeah. uh, and the other one is, uh, in which is what, how high is the temperature that actually uh, uh, oh, glass is produced? Yeah. Temperature range is not an issue. Eight, nine hundred, a thousand, eleven hundred. No, I'm asking because I, I would like to see what kind of plant remains you would actually the, they would survive. And uh, yeah. we don't know, I, I mean, to my knowledge, we don't know anything about the fuel. Uh, for uh, the glass uh, yeah. f furnaces, yeah. but if if it's if it's that high, you wouldn't yeah. expect to find uh, a lot of uh, plant remains, for example. You would expect to find a lot of the ash. The ash, yes. So um, yeah. Phytholis, maybe. Yeah, phytholis only. Possibly. We know from historical um, sources, 16th century onward, and from ethnographic India, the use of completely dried logs of mm -hmm. wood. Um, there are fantastic pictures from the 17th century French glass houses where you have a big industrial scale glass furnace and five meter high stacked on top of that furnace logs of wood. Mm -hmm. Perfectly managed woodlands, very long straight woods, bone dry in that um, health and safety wouldn't allow it to, mm -hmm. to do that today, but you need absolutely fast burning dry wood. We know from India that stuff like mustard stalks mm -hmm. after the harvest are perfect for that glass firing. Again, very rapid burning and you need a flame because you have your yeah. firing above the glass and you need to get the heat down as opposed to the metallurgy where you mix the ore with the fuel and it's all yeah, in the same so place. So because I, I was thinking that uh, for metallurgy at least, the residue, agricultural residues that you can actually use is oil, o olive oil production yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, residues. Yeah. So yeah. in glass though, you wouldn't use something. No, you need that. a, f you, a you good flame. flame. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No you. dung here yeah. and yeah. pomance. I'm Natalie, hi. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> uh, I actually just have a question. I presume that they had um, like colored glass. Yes. And I'm curious about how they actually went about uh, introducing the color into the glass and if that affects the chemical makeup at all. Yep. And uh, then if that can also help provenance the glass. Yes and no. Depends on when and where you are. If you've got half an hour. <laughs> So blue is the first color of choice in glass. Um, blue glass you can make very easily with a little bit of copper oxide, a fraction of a percent of copper oxide. And copper bronze is a very widespread available material and a tenth of a percent is enough. So it's not too expensive. That's why it's technically easy and easily available. So basically everybody was making blue glass and then either making whole blue glass vessels or just applying blue dots or trails decoratively on the vessel. Now if you do that and then you recycle that broken vessel and you have a dot of blue glass on it which has a tenth of a percent of copper oxide, that doesn't sound much but if you express this as parts per million that would be 1,000 parts per million of copper oxide. And if you have only 1% of that glass in your recycled glass, you still have 10 ppm copper, um, 10 parts per million from that in the whole lot, and you can analyze for that concentration. So that copper lead comes with it, tin sometimes comes with it, with a proper analysis, laser ablation, ICPMS, you can see that it's exactly one of those recycling indicators that we are chasing. If we now go another 1,500 years back in time into the Bronze Age, we can see cobalt blue glass, the dark, intensive royal blue glass that 
was only made in Egypt but not in Mesopotamia, where in Mesopotamia people were happily doing copper blue glass. So in some cases you can provenance it, but here in this uh, later period, empire, too much trade, everybody had access to more or less everything. Unless you are very detailed with your data, um, it's more difficult to provenance um, as a rule of thumb. But it's important additional information. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Haris. <laughs> uh, okay, my question is, do we have any data showing uh, if glass was considered a luxury? Uh, I mean, if rich people were using, the, using it instead of ceramic, uh, yeah. so... Yes. It's like today. If you go to Alpha Mega and you buy a glass box of beer glasses or something, it's cheap and cheerful. If you go to an upper class, whatever, gallery, you buy an artistic glass object, a vase, and you pay 2,000 euros for that. And the same you have in the Roman Empire. You have absolutely high-end luxury glass objects mm -hmm. fit really for the top fraction of a percent. These diatreta glass, the very highly decorated and carved glass, or glass that is different color in different light, green and red, depending on how the, the, the light shines through the glass, and you have it mass-produced. The historical sources talk about dismissively about those people who collect broken glass, which is so cheap, and they change, exchange it for sulfur, and uh, it's rubbish. But at the same time, you have very high-end, high-quality glass, which is fit for the king. Because if you, if you were ordering yeah. glass from Egypt or whatever, I mean, surely you won't know whether you want a red glass or a blue glass or whatever. You are asking whether glass coloration effectively yeah. was done at the primary source or at the secondary source. And that is one of the most interesting and still open questions that um, people are heavily discussing. Um, as I said earlier, with the copper blue, everybody was able to do copper blue glass, and they would just take a relatively clean raw gl primary glass and add a little bit of copper for the local need. If you look down the recycling chain into the really often recycled material, the very cheap and cheerful, you end up with bangles, glass bangles, which are often very dark black. And there you can have almost everything thrown in. So that is not the high-end material. But then you look at glass that is red, transparent, which is colored with gold, a few ppm, and that is a highly specialist, probably a workshop serving just the emperor, um, making a very specific high-quality glass and working with the best raw materials, the freshest glass they can get. So again, you have the whole spectrum, and that makes it so interesting, every individual case to interpret and to see what does it tell me about this particular site. Right, so if I can make another, another question. Yes, please. If you have the know-how and the capacity to make a furnace, mm -hmm. And the only thing you need to introduce is the uh, sodium oxide or whatever, yes. natrium. Yes. Why wouldn't you do the primary, you know, the glass here? Here in Cyprus, you would have enough fuel for that. And you could get your, your natron, your sodium carbonate from Egypt. Actually, on that road ship lane, the Roman Empire was shipping thousands of tons of grain every year from Egypt to Constantinople, to Rome, to feed the big capitals. On the back of that seaborne trade, a lot of other trade could have happened, including glass or natron. 
So, but here, if you go into the Trodos where your fuel is, you won't find much white sand. And if you have more than half a percent, more than one percent iron oxide in your sand, you get a glass that is good for a German beer bottle, um, so dark brown, but not good for the discerning Roman middle class who want something nice on the table. Um, Patrick de Gries, good colleague, um, who will be here next week for our summer school, he did a European Research Council project mapping beach sand concentrations, qualities around the Mediterranean because the Roman authors talk about glass making in France, glass making in Italy. We don't see it archaeologically and he has shown that none of the beaches are um, suitable for that with very few exceptions outside that stretch between the Nile and the Levantine coast which effectively is all sand washed down from Ethiopia. The granite rocks breaking up down the Nile, washing relatively quartz rich clean sand into the sea and then up the coast um, and changing its composition a little bit as it's been washed up there. Outside that sand supply, it's tough. Even if you would have your fuel and your soda, the sand is still missing. And that's a driver for the Bohemian glass in early modern Czechoslovakia, Germany, Bavaria, where you have veins of rock crystal, of quartz, absolutely clean quartz. That was driving the glass industry there, but that's uh, of a very different period because it was so absolutely clean. There's a social function to it, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Thank you.